Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Goldston. I'm the director of MIT's Washington office, and I'm going to moderate tonight's panel on why the 2022 elections may determine the future of democracy in the U.S. Uh, I want to start by saying a word about how we uh, got to this subject. So uh, we did a panel in 2020 on a range of election issues, and we were thinking of doing that again for 2022. But then we decided it would be most useful to focus on these democracy issues because they're probably more obscure le and less fully understood than many of the election issues, other election issues, and yet they really underlie everything. Um, we depend on our electoral and democratic system to resolve all the other issues that may come up during a campaign. When we talk about democracy issues, and we'll hopefully be exploring a number of them tonight, we're talking about kind of a constellation of issues, who gets to vote, when they get to vote, where they get to vote, how their ballots are counted, and whether what those final counts are viewed as legitimate as to sort of uh, some of the issues that will uh, that constitute these dem democracy issues. So uh, let me introduce the panel we have tonight. First, uh, Charles Stewart. He's the Keenan Sahin Distinguished Professor of Political Science at MIT. He's an off-sited expert on elections. In 2017, he established the MIT Election Data and Science Lab, and he's also a member of the Caltech MIT Voting Technology Project. Uh, our second panelist is Jessica Hoosman. She is the editorial director of VoteBeat, and she was previously the lead elections reporter for, Pro, for ProPublica, and she's taught at the Columbia Journalism School and NYU. And last but not least, Chris Capizola, who's a professor of history at MIT and a McVicker fellow. And he's also the senior associate dean for open learning. Um, he's active in bringing history to the public through many roles, including as a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Um, a few uh, other notes before we start. First, many, uh, Wash uh, many MIT offices, including the MIT Washington office and a number of student groups, uh, including MIT Vote, helped uh, sponsor and pull together this uh, panel. And uh, we're going to, the panel is designed to be nonpartisan, uh, although we may talk about how partisanship figures into these issues that we're discussing tonight. So with that, let me, uh, let me jump right in and start with a broad general question that hopefully will underscore a lot of what we want to talk about tonight. Um, it might sound to some that the title of this panel about the future of democracy in the U.S. is hyperbole, but I think all of us mean it quite literally. So in what ways, how and why is so much at stake for democracy in this election? And let me start with Charles on that. Um, thanks, David, and thanks for, um, thanks for um, presiding over us tonight, and thanks to everybody who put together this panel. Um, to get started, let me just say a, a, a few things. The first thing I will say is that um, despite the fact that this panel is about the challenges to democracy and there are real, there are real challenges um, to the democracy, um, I think it's important to address this question without um, um, acting like our hair is on fire. Um, I, of course, long ago, um, um, I've got rid of that problem of hair on fire. But I think that one of the issues facing us in the challenges of democracy these days is that um, the challenges can seem so vast and they are coming, can seem to be coming from so many directions. And so many claims are being made that it can seem kind of hopeless and it can seem that basically the barbarians are at the gate. Um, I think it's important for us to take, for those of us concerned about democracy in the United States and around the world, I think it's important for us to take a deep breath, to do the things that we do at MIT really, really well, which is to try to break down problems into their component parts and to understand what's going on. And once we do that, we can begin to understand not only the problems, but also potentially ways, um, well, first of all, we can, we can prioritize problems and figure out which are real problems to democracy and maybe which are problems that are more kind of normal public policy debates between liberals and conservatives about how we vote. Um, 
And then we can also begin to think about what actual approaches to different problems are because not every problem is the same in the space. Um, and so some people see me as being kind of the optimistic person in kind of as among academics who deal with democracy and voting. And one of the reasons I'm, I try to, I come across as optimistic is because I really do believe that by applying scientific principles and being careful about data and careful about facts, we can understand problems and we can solve them and that we don't have to be hopeless in the face of great challenges. So that's kind of the, that's a whole bunch of, of throw clearing before getting to David's really good question about um, what's at stake for the democracy in, in this moment. So I, I'll just make a couple of points. I think just to get cut to the chase, we are living in a moment in which not only are political leaders um, making hay by um, suggesting that democracy is broken and um, undercutting um, unfairly um, um, trust in the democratic process. But there has arisen social movements um, that we haven't seen probably, certainly in maybe half a century, that actually give institutional weight to that rhetoric. Um, every election, losers are disappointed. And every election, the losers will grumble and talk about the other side as having stolen it or done something like that. But eventually they lick their wounds and then they come back to fight another day. What we have right now is very different. Um, and I hope we can talk more about this, but we have, um, you know, we have media outlets who are making millions of dollars off of selling um, mis and disinformation about what's happening. We have, um, we have essentially snake oil dealers who are going around the country, who are making millions of dollars putting in their own pocket by selling lies. By, and then, and I, I'm hoping that Jessica can tell us has a lot of stories about this, um, turn loose their followers onto the people who actually run our elections and terrorize them. And so that institutionalization of anti-democratic -dem attitudes is I think one of the things at stake here and what makes this moment very, very different. So that's kind of a big thing. I think the smaller thing is what we, what we read in the newspaper every, every day, that this is an election, it's a midterm election. So the emphasis on, is on state and local elections by and large, as well as the House of Representatives and part of the Senate. So a lot of the people on the ballots are those who will be responsible for running elections in the next presidential election. Not only that, they'll be responsible for running elections, perhaps in the next town, set of town elections and, and all those sorts of things. And while I believe in the robustness of a lot of the electoral system, that with the wrong people in charge, there can be even more chaos than we have now. Um, and, and so there are people on the ballots um, that can really make a difference in um, how easily elections run in the next few um, years. The final thing I'll just say, and I think this is going under, under, under the radar, but you know, two years ago amid the pan pandemic, there was great concern and great questions about whether we would be able to pull off that election in light of the challenges faced and I think the consensus among thinking people is that it was one of the best elections ever run, even before you apply degrees of difficulty. Um, it was a really well run election. And one of the reasons for that is the nation pulled together and made it work despite um, everything facing us. I think that election denialism is causing maybe even more acute problems, challenges for running this election. And so I think we need to think about at this moment, whether you know this could be the real test of the ability to pull off elections in difficult times, because we don't have zuck bucks to come in and pay for everything. We, you know, we don't have everybody just rushing in to provide hand sanitizers and, and, be, and be poll workers. Um, this is a very different environment. And I think it's gonna be, gonna be a, lot, a lot more challenging. And so I think you know, 
we're, you know, a month from now, we will know really how robust this electoral system is in a way that we probably thought we might encounter in 2020, but we really didn't. So I'll stop there for the moment. Thanks. That's a great intro. I'd say you started with great optimism, went to words like terrorize, and then ended with guarded optimism. So with that, um, probably all of which are justified. So um, Jessica, you're um, following this around the country, um, taking off from where Charles was. Where, where, how do you see uh, democracy being at, at stake in this election? And then after we go to Chris, we'll talk about some specific races. You know, I think the terrorization of election officials is really a nice segue into, into the point I'd like to make, which is that, you know, I, I think that people think about the problems facing American democracy as as sort of temporary, right? And and I and I think by and large they're correct. But I think what people don't consider is that the impact to a system like voting is much more enduring because voting is generational and voting only happens once every two or for most people every four years, right? And so it's not a problem that we get a thousand at bats to fix right this is this is something that's going like deeply held beliefs on election entrench into an entire generation and affect voter behavior for quite a long time and so we can see the the hints at at what that's going to mean for us in the future and one of the most direct i think is that because of all of the pressure and horrible treatment of elections officials, a lot of them have left. Um, so since 2020, I'm in Texas, so I'll just use Texas as an example. There are 254 counties in Texas since 2020. 81 of those counties have had a change in election administrators, and several of those counties are unstaffed. Um, and, and that is something that's going to affect this election, but it's also something that's going to affect the local election happening in two months and the local election happening two months after that. And, and, and that's, that's going to endure. And so we are not at a place of crisis yet, I think, but in order to avoid a place of crisis, we're going to have to turn this ship around right now. Thanks. And Chris, that's a good um, segue to someone with historical perspective. So what's your sense of uh, why why, and how democracy is uh, an issue in this election and how does that fit with other periods? Um, so I'll second uh, some of the comments that have already been made about the, the stakes of this election while also seconding uh, Charles Stewart's um, guarded optimism. Um, and I think that that history teaches some important lessons on both, on both fronts. First of all, I think it's important to remember that this you know, if I, you go back to your question, what's at stake for democracy in this election? I think um, we have to think about democracy in, in two ways, right? First, um, it's about democratic rules and processes, um, norms, and um, and actually sort of you know, the rules of the game, right? And I think in you know some of our, our discussions that come forward, we'll talk about very specific uh, elections, very specific roles played by state legislatures um, and state uh, and, and and state uh, officials. Um, and it's very important um, to address those in 2022 because those people will wield significant power in 2024 um, in an election that people will be extremely, you know, sort of invested in. Um, and I think that in many ways, the election of 2020 taught people the significance um, of these state offices uh, and those roles. And I think that, you know, they are on the ballot in ways they, they would not have been in the midterm election, you know, even uh, 10 years ago, for sure. But I think it's also important to think about um, what's at stake for democracy in the broader sense, right? Democracy as a sort of practice uh, of everyday politics. And um, you know, this, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll probably say this five times during the hour tonight, right? That um, democracy is, um, you know, is what we do every day right? in all of our institutions, um, both, you know, sort of our public representative institutions, as well as our, our workplace, um, in our communities, um, our voluntary associations, even our families. Um, and I think it's, it's easy, you know, very clear that in 2020, um, all of that was tested. It was tested by the pandemic. It was tested by election denialism. It was tested by outside interference um, in electoral processes. And America, And the reason I think the stakes are very high right now is that we have 
a choice, right? Um, as Americans, we can either, um, you know, we have to decide, um, you know, sort of which direction we're going, right? Um, and one direction is to sort of lean in to that sense that um, our hair is on fire, right? As Charles put it, right? And sort of lean into uh, the partisanship, lean into the anger and, and lean into the distrust of people across the aisle, right? Um, <clears throat> that is a fundamental, it's a fundamentally, appealing thing to do at this moment, right, um, on either side of the aisle, but it's a fundamentally undemocratic thing to do, right? And so by doing that, we are choosing to avoid democratic practices in our life, right? And we need to sort of embrace those, um, which means sort of, you know, uh, the, the old line, right, the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy, right? Um, you know, both in the institutions of state legislatures and in our everyday life. Thanks, that's uh, a good, uh, segue actually to our next question, which is, let's get into the nuts and bolts of this a little bit before we go back to the, the roles that Chris mentioned. So um, frankly, one of the reasons for this panel is to get people to register to vote and to actually vote um, back in their home territories in particular, as well as in Massachusetts. Um, so let's dig in and, and look at some of the specific races. So I'll start with Jessica. What are some of the key races nationally. Um, I know Michigan and Arizona are often two states that are cited, but what are some of the elections where, um, whether it's the front and center issue or not, where the democracy and the future of it are most at stake or most at issue? You know, this is, this is a really interesting question. And I find myself sort of like shifting around my murder board of which state I should be most concerned about on a near daily basis. But as of this moment in time, um, my my biggest concern, I think, is it remains Arizona. Um, I, I, I think that there are enough statewide candidates there that you know, may may not be getting the splash that they were hoping for, but are certainly making waves in that state in a way that I think will stick around for a while. So that's pretty concerning to me. Um, you know, I, I also think that there are a couple of races that are, that don't necessarily have much to do with the direct election administration of elections that are going to be pretty problematic in the future. I mean, Ken Paxton in Texas will almost certainly be reelected um, come November, and he has some really interesting interpretation of state election code um, that that I think you know he can't necessarily personally do harm with, but there is a lot of harm that he could foment. Um, or, or at least fail to prevent. And, and he's already expressed a lot of desire to, to be that person. So, you know, I, I think that it, it's it's often not the the most obvious race that that is the most concerning thing. You know, I think that um, there are election deniers on the ballot and those issues are being spoken about front and center and, and really addressed very cleanly in the debate. But then there are all of these sort of offshoot offices that either manage investigations or they interpret state law or they're the ones giving direction to counties um, that that I think we should have a more fulsome discussion of in terms of their impact on the on the election system. So before I turn to Charles, let me let me ask you one follow up question for people on Ken Paxton is the attorney general of Texas. Um, can you say for folks who haven't been following this just uh, in Arizona, what are what races and what is it about the those races that these issues uh, that implicates these issues? Yeah, so Mark Fincham is uh, running for the chief elections officer of the state of Arizona, and he is fascinating. Uh, last two nights ago, he tagged me in a tweet that referenced both George Soros and the World Economic Forum, which is a which is a heck of a thing. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it, this is full conspiracy level stuff. Um, and, and he has laid out his policies and his plans for elections in Arizona very clearly, and none of them would end well for the people of Arizona. Um, and, and so I think that one is the one I'm most specifically um, worried about. You know, the race for governor in Arizona is also very concerning, but the governor of Arizona doesn't necessarily have hands-on um, ability to mess with that system in, in quite as direct of a way as the Secretary of State there does. And so that that is really the race that kind of keeps me up at night. Great. Um, 
Uh, Charles, uh, either on those races or other ones that you would point to where these issues are at stake? You're on, you're on mute. After two and a half years, you would think. Um, <laughs> okay, hold on a second. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I t absolutely agree with what, what Jessica said, that Arizona, yet again, is um, a place that everybody is going to be watching. And I, I will add, and this is kind of getting a bit of the weeds and maybe getting a little either off topic a little bit or later in, into the presentation, the thing about Arizona and their vote counting is that there's a really good chance that we won't know who win the who wins these races until maybe Friday of election week, um, which has been kind of that you know kind of you know, um, Senator Cinema was like that, and, and a lot of the elections in in, in Arizona um, because of the way they do things take a long time to unfold, and so not only do I worry about um, you know, there's been, and because of the cyber ninjas and all of that, there's been a lot of practice already in Arizona around um, kind of interrupting and disrupting um, elections um, in that state. And so I, I, not only do I worry about what happens after the election, I actually worry in the days between election day and the end of the week about how the counting unfolds and how even just the narrative of how we get from election day to the final result, how that happens in Arizona, because I could see that very well um, erupting into something that's kind of out of control, depending on how things go. So I think that, you know, Arizona is certainly a place to look. There's, a, you know, um, the other, the, usually if you go to various newspapers and they talk about these things, you know, you know, they will then point out these other races, like in Wisconsin, where, well, you know, then you get a kind of into inside baseball because the Secretary of State doesn't doesn't run elections, but who knows? Maybe he will in the future. So there's actually some attention into what's happening in in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. There, um, actually, there's a, we should do a plug for um, Governor Wolf appearing at MIT tomorrow. Um, um, He's not up for election. <laughs> uh, he was not up for elect. Who is not up for election? Um, but um, that's a case where the governor of Pennsylvania appoints the secretary of state. And so there's been a lot of attention, attention there. It turns out that the, um, the Democratic um, nominee for that um, position is doing quite well. And the, um, and the um, Republican nominee, who is very much an election denier, keeps, um, has not learned the law of holes and just keeps... <laughs> Um, just digging deeper and deeper and deeper. So, you know, that's something that, that people are, might be looking at. But I think a lot of the states where you might imagine there would be kind of real likelihood that a strong election denier might take over a state, um, things actually kind of look a bit better than we thought going in, you know, kind of going into this election. And so the thing that I'm most concerned about right now um, is what and what's going to happen at the county level, at the town level, in, in state legislatures, and in county commissions. Um, because um, ultimately, local governments um, conduct elections in the United States. We saw in 2020 a, a, a beginning of the playbook whereby local governments attempted to subvert the normal order in say the um, um, the certification of elections, we saw we you know we saw that in Wayne Wayne County. We saw it kind of here and there, and we've seen a little bit of that sort of activity even in in the primary system. What I worry about is um, hard right election denialists taking over entire county commissions, and um, and starting to do things to the voting machines or start doing things to try to purge election, you know, voting rolls or try to do things to um, not certify elections in the future. Um, I'm still optimistic to believe that, well, you know, the legal system will take care of that. But if we have enough of these little fires to put out within a state, then it makes Donald Trump's legal challenges in 2020 look like the minor leagues because you could very well 
I mean, the other analogy I used for people of a certain age was back on the old Ed Sullivan sh show, the guy who would come out and spin, spin plates on poles and would run around and keep all these plates going. I think that's gonna, that's, that's, that could very well happen in 2024 if state legislature or if county commissions in you know, states like, you know, name the states, Nevada and Wisconsin and, 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 and Michigan and, um, and, and the rest, some of these are, are, are not counties, but towns, um, are controlled by people who are, who are deep denialists and try to do things to circumvent the normal certification of elections and maybe try to um, basically become election vigilantes, um, a little of which we're seeing right now. Um, so I can't put, put names and places um, necessarily on these because um, I keep being surprised that kind of, oh, look, this, I get called by, by, by reporters in the middle of nowhere and they say, you know what's happening here? Um, and um, and it, things, things are just popping up at, in local governments right now um, so, that we need to be attentive to. So with, with that, before I um, ask Chris the same question about specific races, let me add one uh, question that we got from the audience and uh, people should feel free to start, um, as some have, uh, throwing questions our way as I continue to ask some of the other ones that I've got. But this this one relates very much to what Jessica and Charles were talking about, um, which is how can or should everyday voters evaluate these lesser known offices that are so important to democracy? So Chris, in addition to specific races, you may be watching any thoughts on how a voter can make sense of this sort of vast panoply of positions that they normally might ignore? Um, absolutely. And I think uh, I'll defer to the other two panelists on sort of the, you know, the, the specifics of, of these races. They follow them um, in, at a level of detail that, uh, that I really value. Um, I think I'll just respond maybe to, uh, to Charles Stewart's most recent uh, comment and say, um, that it underlines the importance for, for individual voters um, uh, to ensure that they know what they're doing um, ahead of time, right? And that's something I think many of us have taken for granted, um, that all you have to do is, you know, sort of turn 18 and, and suddenly you'll be participating um, in this system. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, challenges to your ability to, to cast your vote um, may proliferate. Um, in this election or, or ones to come, uh, and that it's important for voters to be, first of all, um, equipped with understanding of how they can do it, right, to make sure that they understand the registration rules um, that apply to them, um, depending on where they establish their residence, um, and that they understand what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of forms of identification or what or registration materials are necessary, uh, what they uh, can and can't do um, in in a case in which their registration may be challenged. Um, there's, there may very well be alternative voting um, or sort of provisional ballots that they can nevertheless cast. There may be election officials to whom they should address their concerns, either at the, at the, at the time um, or afterward. Um, and that, that kind of thing, there are organizations, nonpartisan organizations, which we'll hear about over the course of the hour, um, to which they can turn um, you know, for that information. Um, and I think that those are the same kind of uh, organizations that are dedicated to providing uh, sort of reliable information about candidates in local, sort of local races and, concern, uh, and, and, and uh, concerns about those. Do you want to name yeah. a few of those while you're taking a point? Um, I, you know, I mean, I think uh, for me, I start with in many ways one of the oldest, right? The League of Women Voters, um, which of course, uh, you know, sort of represents voters of, of all, all genders, but, uh, you know, sort of emerged in the early 20th century um, in, the, in the wake of, of the, the, the uh, amendment, uh, constitutional amendment granting women the right to vote. Um, and that has sort of dedicated itself in, in the decades since to sort of collecting this information um, and, and sort of, you know, making, making it accessible to, uh, to the public. Um, and I think that it's also fair to just ask candidates um, questions, right? Um, you know, to just, you know, to sort of write to them, um, to, you know, sort of email them, to come to candidate forums and to just express your, you know, your, your voice and, and your questions. Um, you don't have to believe the answers. You don't have to trust the answers. Um, you know, uh, the promises may not be, may not be fulfilled. Um, but I think, you know, sort of showing up and asking questions um, is, is, is important, even in races where you think that the outcome is already predetermined. That's helpful, thanks. So Jessica, any thoughts on this question from the audience that Chris started to address on 
what's a voter to do? How are they supposed to know, uh, you know, who to be concerned about in this regard? Yeah, so I, I think that um, the thing that that I love to tell people is that you should figure out what your county election administrator is called. Um, it, this is this is a thing that varies by county. Sometimes it's a registrar, sometimes it's a clerk, sometimes it's an election administrator, sometimes it's a precinct judge. Like there are lots of different versions of this, but you know, pay attention if that race is on the ballot. If that is an elected position in your county, you should pay attention to it. But you know, the easiest way I think to get a list of everything is to go and usually um, large jurisdictions minimally have sample ballots online or you can get one. Um, and, and so you should request your sample ballot, get it, make notes on it, figure out who you want to vote for and go race by race by race. But that is the easiest way to do it rather than Googling like, who's my representative? And then trying to figure out if they're running for office, just get the ballot um, and, and you can start from there. Great. So um, let me ask one other general question that we're getting also some additional really good questions like that one from the audience. So you start, you all started talking about this um, in response to the last few questions, but um, so there are these more obscure and more local offices that Jessica just mentioned, but in terms of sort of some of the more key offices, senators, representatives, governors, state legislatures, secretaries of state, um, how do they generally fit into this picture? It obviously varies a little bit state to state, but all of them, I think, have some role in uh, these democracy issues. So, um, Jessica, why don't I start again with you for a minute on just in general what some of these key positions are uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that the key, the most key positions are going to be the positions that are closest to you, like, and I mean that physically. Um, so, you know, more or less representatives and senators don't have a ton of control over the literal administration of election. Do they sow a lot of misinformation? Yes. Should we reward them in kind for that sowing? Probably yes, but they can't necessarily manipulate the way that an election goes or how your state chooses to clean the voter rolls or things like that, because all of that is determined at a state level. Yeah, um, perhaps in presidential elections. Except for, well, so in perhaps in presidential elections, the states and counties are still carrying out the physical vote, even right. if there's some some more, you know, larger standards that they have to abide by. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that what what's really important is is understanding that like elections are incredibly local and if you want to impact how the vote is conducted in your county the races that you should be most concerned about are on the county level that's great charles any thoughts on that on how different positions fit in yeah i mean i have person um oh good i'm 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 not muted um yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing I, I would do is just absolutely underscore um, what Jessica said. I mean, there there is there is this bias toward looking at the at the kind of the you know the, the top of the ticket, the marquee events, um, and certainly senators and governors have an important role in, in, in you know they are noticed, and they have an important role in setting expectations for other people in the. And the electoral system. I mean, the fact that Josh Hawley was seen, you know, pumping his fist on um, January 6th had consequences because people were paying attention to that in a particular context. Um, but um, I mean, Jessica is exactly right that it's the, you know, it really is what I call the blocking and tackling and running elections in the short term, where, um, you know, whether we, you know, whether the system works or not really matters. Um, and after that, that in most places, it, it becomes in something like 38 of the 50 states, you know, it's the Secretary of State. Um, and in other places, it's Lieutenant Governor or somebody like that, or an election board. So, you know, those are the, you know, those are the ones that really kind of have regulatory control, can give guidance can be more or less aggressive in, in, in certain respects in administering elections. But my sense over you know, 20 years of studying this is that even those positions, like the, you know, even the Secretary of State is constrained by a state constitution, federal and state laws. And so that their attempts to go to color outside of the lines 
usually has an effect of sowing confusion and discord um, about the electoral system rather than having immediate effects of, of killing democracy or suppressing the vote. It's more of an invidious sort of thing. And that's why um, you know, I really, I, mean, I, I have to really agree that um, you know, if I were concerned about the state of elections in my hometown, I would find out what was on my ballot. Um, if only there was something where you could type in somebody's name and get news reports and other things on the computer where you could find out about them. So Google the names of all the people running for county commission, of all the people who are running for town council, and just find out if any of them are election deniers. One of the challenges for a lot of these local offices is that they run on a nonpartisan basis. So to the degree that there is kind of a partisan tilt in some of this, you can't even rely on partisan labels. You really, I mean, you gotta know about the people. Um, and to be clear, not all Republicans are election deniers e either. And so, I mean, you really gotta understand the individuals. And that's where the beauty of the internet um, can really unfold if you, you know, get your sample ballot and figure out who, who you get to vote for. So that's an interesting transition to the question I'm going to ask Chris, which came in from one of our uh, viewers. Um, I think it's it's mildly depressing, but entirely on target. This is, I get the sense from many of my peers that they're tired after 2020. What makes energy around democracy sustainable? Does democracy rely on this energy? So you just talked about the kind of effort that has to go into really preserving democracy, especially right now. Chris, do you have thoughts on that question about how do you sustain energy in a democracy and when and how we've been good at it? Um, that is, it's a great question. And I'm, and I'm glad um, that this audience member sort of put that on, on the table because I think um, the, there are ways in which the, the news cycle um, sort of is exhausting. Right. Um, there are ways in which conflict, um, whether that is playing out in, in the halls of a legislature or over like a family Thanksgiving table, um, can be really exhausting um, and, um, <clears throat> and make it so easy to sort of step away. Right. Um, and that can be confirmed for people who uh, either feel like who feel on some level that their vote doesn't count. Um, you know, maybe they don't live in Michigan or Arizona. Um, you know, maybe they don't, you know, um, they, they voted for a third party candidate. Maybe they voted um, and, you know, the candidate didn't turn out to be the way that they, they thought. Um, and it's very easy to lose that, that energy. Um, I will say, um, you know, that it is, uh, you know, voting is, it, it's a muscle um, and it takes exercise. Um, and I think that um, there are, in that sense, lessons of history of people who um, who went to great lengths um, to to exercise um, a right that many of us um, may may have doubts about its effectiveness, right? And, and here, I think it's really important, you know, to go back to uh, to Charles's point at the beginning um, that we um, are told right now that we should be, you know, sort of hyper concerned, um, despite the fact that many of these democratic um, sort of processes are in fact actually working very well. Uh, and I think it's worth re remembering um, that they have not always worked very well, um, that, that people have been systematically excluded from the vote, both by law and by force. Um, and they, they were not dissuaded, right? That history teaches the importance of, of courage, um, of persistence, um, and of democratic practice, right? Getting out there and voting over and over again um, and sort of exercising the, the, the voting muscle, right? So I guess the person who, who is tired, I would guess I would say, you know, um, is I hope it's the kind of tired that you have after you've had a really good workout, right? And that aim for that tired, right? Um, rather than the kind of tired when you just don't wanna get up off the couch. Uh, that's great. And I, it also brings up another thing, which is, you know, if you look at, American elections through history, they're probably more open, less corrupt, more managed in a good sense now than probably ever, even though um, skepticism about them inversely may be at a, at a peak. Charles, let me ask you a related question to the one we uh, I asked Chris, and this one also comes from the audience, but it's uh, 
uh, quoting something that you had said. So the question is, what does the regular voter need to do to quote unquote, turn this ship around to use the phrase you used in your opening? Was, does turning out to vote help in that process? I think um, that was me. How? <laughs> yeah, that was Jessica. So Jessica gives this. Oh, question. okay, sorry, <laughs> there you go. Uh, how do we turn this ship around? Well, I mean, I think that there are a couple of there are a couple of concrete things that you can do. And I, yeah, Charles has probably heard me say this a thousand times in the time that we've known each other, but you should go and be a poll worker. Um, it, that is that is the best and most practical thing that you can do, right? One of the, the reasons that these problems are so enduring and, and last so long and election administrators feel overburdened is because there just aren't enough poll workers to spread out the work. And so these few few people get all of the work, they get all of the negative consequences and, and popular anger uh, going around. Um, and, and people who have been poll workers for a really long time are just like, I don't want to deal with this anymore, right? And so if you can fill that void, then that's materially useful to your county, is materially useful to the literal function of democracy. But also, by virtue of going through poll worker training, you learn an incredible amount about the election system such that you yourself become a bulwark to misinformation that perhaps people you know might be spreading without realizing how damaging it is. You know, I mean, I encounter every single day people who have well-intentioned but altogether incorrect interpretations or impressions of how local elections or statewide elections or even federal elections are conducted. Um, and the best people to answer questions about how elections work in your surrounding community is a poll worker. And so if you can be one, you help the county and then also become a resource for information. And so that's like a real big way to yank that steering wheel. That's great. And um, goes back to what we were saying, including you earlier about concern about the threats to, to poll workers these days. By the way, that misattribution was mine, not the questioners, but might even just as well, because the next question that came in is a good one for Charles, um, which is, uh, we hear often that election security is a prime issue these days. Are there any reasons to be legitimately afraid or concerned regarding election security? And obviously, yeah. you can define election security as part of your answer. So. Right, you know, I was going to say, I mean, election security can, be, can mean a number of things. You know, between 2016 and into 2020, we thought about election security as being really focused on kind of cybersecurity, um, you know, the protection of the assets associated with voting, and, um, and, and, and the parallel, the assets associated with campaigns and elections and all of that. And, um, and, and I have some thoughts about that. I mean, I think that we're in a better place in the United States right now because, because this, especially on the election administration side, we understand the enormity of the problem. And um, most of the country, particularly people running elections, um, are not only, have not only taken um, kind of diversionary tactics, but are aware kind of hyper aware of the dangers and are you know kind of making their lists and checking them twice to make sure that they're they're doing best practices in the security realm so um i you know i, I feel good about um about security and in fact i think one of the reasons why we felt that 2020 was so, such a good election was not only um did we just kind of get through the pandemic but that the worries about cybersecurity and the protection of the election assets um, look like you know, things went really smoothly. Um, not that you can always ever rest assuming that things will be secure, but I, I think um, the election administration um, community is taking these issues as seriously as any other critical infrastructure um, area and in many ways more so. Um, and, and so that's one type of security. Another type of security I, um, oftentimes is thought about really as um, making sure we're not flipping flipping votes in the voting machines, um, which I never thought, well, that we would be talking a lot about. 
And um, there, I, you know, if it, if it weren't the present moment, if it weren't the present moment, I think that it is right for citizens to trust but verify in elections. I think that's absolutely right. I think that um, it is right for citizens in a democracy to require of their election officials to demonstrate to the citizens through multiple means that the election was conducted fairly and their outcome was, was correct. And um, um, I'm convinced that you know, kind of the voting machines aren't flipping votes and all those sorts of things. But um, I, you know, I think we need to we, we need to think about how we can better convince people who are willing to be convinced that the machines are secure, that the procedures were followed, that mules weren't, <laughs> weren't dumping in 20,000 ballots someplace, and that the system itself, you know, administratively is secure. Um, a robust auditing regime is an important part of that. MIT is um, I'm Ron Rivest, who just had his retirement party um, last Friday, um, is one of the leaders in the field of election auditing. Um, and um, um, you know, there are things that we as technologists or technologists at MIT can help to provide that technical assurance through things like auditing. Um, um, yeah, so. So anyway, I mean, those, those are just some thoughts about the security side. And just to underscore what you said, you're talking about, this is needed, especially now, because there are concerns about legitimacy, not because there's any indication that this has actually been a real problem right now. Right. But I, 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 I should report that over the last 20 years, there's been a constant, I mean, there has been a debate about auditing and about, you know, demonstrating the, 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 re the results. And one of the things that we are we are also observing is that the election denialists are taking these debates and flipping them on the head and suggesting that because the community has been you know struggling with sometimes arguing over some of these issues um, in the way that you do in a policy area and a scientific engineering area that because there's been concerns about security that the system is fundamentally insecure and was in fact hacked by, you know, kind of Venezuelans trying to trying to fill the election. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so it makes this discussion kind of touchy right now because we really should be discussing how, again, for people who will be reassured by things like audits, by um, other procedures for controls, that it, it you know, we, we could probably do better um, and we should do better we probably can't have that conversation right now because the election denialists are hijacking things like audits and they're calling things that are not audits, audits, and just confusing things. Thanks. That, that's a helpful clarification. Um, Chris, let me ask you a question, which will then lead into uh, one from the the audience, which might have to be our last question. We might get a couple more in after those two. So, um, what is it that, I mean, this has been alluded to a number of times, it's obviously not gonna be able to get into all of it, but why, to what extent have democracy issues become partisan and and how, uh, how did this happen? The Washington Post recently found that 53%, so it's just a little more than a majority to get back to Charles's point about far from every Republican, but that 53% of Republican candidates this year for Senate, the House, and key statewide offices uh, deny the results of the 2020 election. How do we get here? Uh, and how do we get out, if you can deal with that too? Yes, well, uh, I can give you some sense of how we got there. I'm not sure I can tell you how we get out. Um, I think it's worth having a conversation about you know, whether, um, uh, whether that's a choice that, that, that we can fully control. Um, I think that um, it's worth bearing in mind um, that um, you know, parties were not designed into the constitutional system at the beginning. They emerged very quickly afterward. Um, and, the, and that two parties have essentially structured American elections um, in, in all of the years um, uh, for, for most of American history. 
Uh, and at times, those parties have not been um, sort of divided in very starkly clear political or ideological uh, divides. Um, and even as recently as the mid 20th century, um, you could very uh, commonly find across the country, conservative Democrats and moderate or, or liberal Republicans um, that may have varied, you know, there might've been as much variation within a party around some issues as there would be between the two parties. Um, that there were people in the mid 20th century who said, well, that's actually a, a weakness and that's a problem, right? If we were on a, a Zoom in 1954, um, we would have all been telling you, you know, parties should be more distinct. Parties should be uh, sort of more legible um, to voters. Uh, they should take stronger positions. Otherwise they just exist to hand out, you know, postmaster general jobs, right? Um, and, um, and well, that was still a cabinet official, but that's a whole other yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Post, postmaster job, right? Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, and so there were people in the mid 20th century who saw um, oh, that, that the system could be made more partisan. Right. Um, and, um, you know, did so through sort of, um, you know, uh, taking taking stronger positions, advocating advertisements that tapped into sort of, um, you know, stronger sort of emotional uh, sort of appeals um, that, that people had. Um, and then this gets amplified in the 1980s and, and particularly in the 1990s. Um, through moves that that, does, that were designed to bring much of the sort of ideological partisanship of presidential elections down to state and local elections, right? Um, and the, you know, much of the credit uh, to the, for the architecture of this has often been attributed to Newt Gingrich of Georgia. In fact, actually, there are multiple players involved in this um, that are designed to, uh, in in part to kind of kind of bring the the partisanship and, and ideology uh, that we associate with the presidential elections um, down to these other places. Um, it has taken off from there. But what you'll notice is that I went through this whole explanation without saying the word Twitter or Facebook um, or social media. Uh, this process predates those technologies. It may be amplified by them, um, but it, it, it may have happened even if those technologies had not come to dominate the ways in which we talk about politics. And what you're saying is because the parties became so ideologically distinct at all levels, there was greater incentive to start questioning elections and make that part of the debate. Is that uh, right? Yes, I think and it has made it harder um, to, um, uh, you know, I think it's not just a, the, what is at stake in winning, but also what's at stake in losing. Um, and I think that that this, um, you know, as as we've seen, you know, is is really kind of crucial. The willingness to lose um, is is one of the things that that we have to sort of preserve as much um, as our our faith in in the game along the way. Right. No, that's a great point. The um, oh, yeah. so could, that... could, I just, could I just jump in really quick on that, yeah. um, which is that I mean, Chris did mention he almost not only did he not mention social media and those those sorts of things, he almost didn't mention elections in that story. Right. And so I think that's also part of it is that everything, you know, why are elections polarized? Everything is polarized. Um, and actually, in some ways, elections relate to the game. Um, and um, which is kind of an interesting thing, um, but now it's here. Um, and, um, and there's probably a whole nother hour about why it was like the game and, and, and why it's here. But I, I, you know, let's just remember that there might not be anything special about elections in, the, in, the, right. in this sense. But I think one way of thinking about that is they're a lagging indicator, but they can bring everything, once they're in the mix, they can bring everything else down with them, which right. gets back to the, the title. Um, so Jessica, maybe the last question tonight. So this is one from a viewer that, that relates to the partisanship question. And they said, how do we make the distinction between digging into partnership and advocating for issues that you care about? So how do you get into the issues without sounding just like a crazed partisan who's not worried about substance is what I take that question to mean. I, you know, I think about that every day. Um, this, so I'm a good person to answer this question. I think that, you know, there are certain things that we can, that we can and should all be able to agree are foundational and not inherently partisan. That people have chosen to make them partisan is sort of neither here nor there, right? So at vote beat, we're not going to dance around the issue of whether or not people should vote. Like, yes you should vote. Like, I don't care for whom, and I don't care, 
by what mechanism you register, but like you should register and you should vote and it should be as easy and secure for you to vote as it possibly can be. And I, and I don't think that stating that as fact um, diminishes my credibility in any way as a journalist, but I, but I think that there is a way to say it that gets at the heart of it being an ideal um, rather than some partisan thing, right? And, and I think if, if we acknowledge, and I hate it, I know, and I know, I know people are going to tweet at me, but whatever, both sides are responsible for so many of these conspiracy theories that are going around right now, right? The Dominion conspiracy theory started with some lefties in Georgia and has spun into what it is today and has now been embraced by the right wing. So the misinformation doesn't have a partisan affiliation. The facts don't have a partisan affiliation. And so as long as I think that we can come back to a central set of facts using as few words as possible and as few personal insults as possible, I think we're going to get to the right place. But I, but I do think that it does require us to say that objectivity and lack of partisanship does not mean is voting a good idea? I don't know. Like that's, you can, ha you can stake a claim without that impacting your judgment or your partisanship in other ways. Great. Thanks. Um, I think we might have time for like quick, like lightning 30 second round each just on, are there any um, reforms in terms of the way voting works or sort of democracy that you would view as sort of something that um, to advocate uh, as part of the democracy issues right now. So again, big question, but very briefly, Charles, do you want to start? Yeah, um, um, this will be 45 seconds. Um, I issue the big reforms um, and mostly, mostly support them, but I don't think this is the time for big reforms. If I were the king of the forest, I would double the budgets of all election officials. And I would say that that would be the big reform is to figure out ways to robustly support um, election officials from top to bottom of mainly at bottom, um, support them with money and personnel to do their jobs. And if you could do that, it's very unsexy, but um, I think that's the most important thing right now. That's great. Real even quicker because um, of the time left, Chris or Jessica, anything you want to throw in there, Chris? Uh, I'll just put in a vote for um, automatic voter registration um, in as many ways as, as possible. Um, Google the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, um, another favorite of mine, and uh, civic education in every state, uh, territory, and tribal jurisdiction in the United States. Great. Jessica? Could not agree with Charles more fully on this. Uh, I, I know that this isn't sexy and I know that it's not named after a voting rights icon, but just giving counties more money is a really good idea. And you should take a look at the Center for Tech and Civic Lives grant program because the things counties don't have money for are not new fancy computers. It's like, hey, the office window is leaking and it's 35 degrees in here in the winter. Like these places have no money. If we gave them even a small injection, we would see those returns immediately for voters. Great, thanks. So I'll add just one uh, uh, website to look at, which is MIT Vote, which helps sponsor this. It's mit.turbovote.org. Um, Thank you all for really uh, interesting and hopefully helpful to the audience uh, discussion. I guess I'll end with um, one of my favorite democracy quotes, which is, um, if I'm remembering it correctly, from the writer E.B. White, who said, uh, democracy is nothing more than the recurrent suspicion that more than half of the people are right more than half of the time. So <laughs> that's sort of A, a thin read, but B, requires everyone to participate or you're not getting the results of that plebiscite. So thank you again and uh, wish everybody a good evening. Thanks.